Welcome to this three-part mini-series centered around deep listening, the life work of composer, musician, writer, and humanitarian Pauline Oliveros. I'm Sharon Stewart, a creator of Soundworks, musician, researcher, poet, and deep listener. In the first episode, Deep Listening, Pauline Oliveros in the Sonosphere, I offer facets of my connection to deep listening, along with some of the history of the practice, as related to the sonic environment, or the sonosphere, with pertinent excerpts from Oliveros' text scores. Together, we can perform a seminal sonic meditation, number eight, environmental dialogue. In the second episode, Deep Listening and Reciprocal Listening with Tina Pearson, I draw upon my own scores and the work of Canadian composer, multimedia artist, and deep listener Tina Pearson, inviting you to contemplate some ways we can involve ourselves in a respectful, listening, and playful dialogue with our sonic environment. This interview forms part of my current area of inquiry for the Artes Professorship Theory in the Arts, namely ethics and ethical practices within artistic research and the creative arts. In the third and final episode, Deep Listening Performance Scores with Lisa E. Harris, I asked Deep Listening practitioner, interdisciplinary artist, creative soprano, and composer Lisa E. Harris from Houston, Texas, to tell us about her connection to deep listening and share with us some scores she has written. For those of you who love participatory vocalizing, this one is for you. Welcome to the first episode, Deep Listening, Pauline Oliveros and the Sonosphere. Infinity equals zero. I could love my listening. I could listen to me listening. I could perform my listening. I could be my listening. Pauline Oliveros in the Roots of the Moment. Before I open into this story of deep listening to our sonic environment, I'd like to bring my attention back to how I'm listening to you all. What are all the aspects of my awareness that I can now direct toward the pleasure of listening to you through this particular medium, even while I'm talking, and especially when I might never hear your voice or your particular soundscape. Simply asking the question, what am I excluding from my listening, can open up a field of possibility that can be quite transformative. And perhaps especially now, while listening online, while listening to each other in the intermittent isolation of the past year, while considering how our listening might include the non-human, the more than human. We are also experiencing how listening is always more than simply hearing with the ears. It includes the body, all the senses, and it also includes listening to and through technology, listening to intuition and to dreams, to messages that we may not be able to place beyond technology, beyond our usual habits of listening. So, that being said, I'll be periodically inviting you to engage with a selection of listening questions offered in Oliveros' 2005 book, Deep Listening, A Composer's Sound Practice. Please feel free to pause your device to take some time to explore the question. Listening question 16. What are you hearing right now? How is it changing?
I came across the 1989 Deep Listening album in 2004 when working on my master's thesis, and I was immediately struck by the other in the music. It spoke to me otherwise, of the bodies of the musicians, the body of the resonant space, a two million gallon underground water cistern in Washington state, of improvisation or instant composition, the reverberating space as a participating actor, the pure sensual joy and love of listening expressed by the musicians. Pauline speaks of this cistern experience at a TED talk in Indianapolis. The meme, deep listening, occurred to me after our recording in the cistern. We had come there to experience the unusual sound. Recording was really an afterthought that resulted in the release of Deep Listening by New Albion Records in 1989. And that was the birth of Deep Listening Band with Stuart Dempster, Paniotis, and myself. The first time I met Pauline Oliveros was in the summer of 2008 at the 18th annual Deep Listening Retreat at the University College Cork, Ireland. And I wrote this following her passing. 26 November, 2016. Her presence, sitting, cross-legged with eyes shut, in the room as the participants came in, immediately called up for me the sense of a weathered granite boulder glistening in the seashore sunlight, stroked by the lapping waves and withstanding the buffeting of the greatest storms. Pauline faced those storms, the student protests against the Vietnam War from 1964 on, including the self-immolation of George Winnie Jr. at the University of California in San Diego in 1970, where she was teaching. Martha Mockus writes in her 2008 book, Sounding Out, Pauline Oliveros and Lesbian Musicality, quote, the assassinations of both the Kennedys and Martin Luther King Jr. were, quote, very upsetting, end quote, Oliveros. And Oliveros said, I felt the temper of the times. I felt the tremendous fear and, what can I say, the opposite of calm. Everybody was in an uproar and I began to feel a tremendous need to find a way to calm myself. The pressures were too great. The social events were simply mirrors of what was inside. I began to retreat. I didn't want to play concerts. End of the quote by Oliveros. Playing long tones on her accordion and singing with them was, in a sense, Oliveros's personal response to this unrest, her musical answer. However, her work with breath, meditation, and sound moved away from the personal to the communal in the form of the women's ensemble and later, the sonic meditations, end quote. Nonverbal forms of expression have been very important within deep listening. And before I move on to the relationship with listenings to one's sonic environment, I would like to take a minute to introduce the nonverbal as a source of personal exploration and collective trust building that is also central to the deep listening practice. Non-verbal, the making of sounds, tones, vibrations with a voice or instrument, as well as tuning into the natural movement of the body. Cries, sighs, hums, tones, flops, convulsions, shakes, slumps. 
that do not rely on semantic meaning but exist, not simply but as expressions of themselves, of a perhaps unconscious state or feeling. When we follow the voice, the body, while letting the prefrontal cortex relax its function to control or filter, we open ourselves to layers of knowledge stored in the body, in the voice, and we give them expression. We listen wholly. When we do this with others and with all that is in our environment, we mirror this whole listening, not just the intellectual self, the edited or scripted self, but the unedited self, the vulnerable self, the bodily, noisy, quiet, intimate self, the very young and very old self who speaks through touch and relies on mirroring to feel safe and understood. We tap into the playful self whose play exists in the playing together, playing with others. But what about this self as it is centered in its immediate sonic surroundings? Oliveros grew up in the rich sonic world, which she would later refer to with the term sonosphere, of Houston, Texas, with both mother Edith Gutierrez and grandmother Pauline Gribben dedicated to piano teaching. In an essay from 2007 entitled My American Music, Soundscape, Politics, Technology, Community, and you can find all references in the podcast notes, Oliveros opens the section on soundscape with, quote, Certainly my childhood in Texas opened into a wonderland of natural sound. There were large rural areas which I relished early on, end quote. Pauline often refers to these sounds as a source of rich joy and inspiration during her childhood, as she also slowly turned to developing her inner sound world, later using Mendel Kleiner's term oralization, one's auditory imagination, which she began to develop in her first steps into composition. Her mother had given her a Sears Roebuck wire recorder as a present in 1947 when she was 15, and a silver tone magnetic tape recorder in 1953 when she was 21. As soon as I got my first tape recorder, I put the microphone in the window of my apartment and recorded. And what I uh, noticed was that there were sounds on the tape that I had not heard. So that I tap myself on the shoulder now any time I record, make sure I listen to everything. And I tell myself to listen to everything all the time. That's my, that's my trip. <laughs> this lifetime devotion to listening developed into the seminal quote by Pauline that shaped my very first interaction with deep listening and that I've contemplated many times since. Deep listening is listening in every possible way to everything possible to hear, no matter what you are doing. Such intense listening includes the sounds of daily life or one's own thoughts, as well as musical sounds. Deep listening represents a heightened state of awareness and connects to all that there is. As a composer, I make my music through deep listening. End quote. Listening question 19. Are you sure that you are hearing everything that there is to hear? In 1991, Pauline wanted to explore deep listening further with others and accepted the invitation of choreographer, dancer, Tai Chi, Qigong, instructor, Eloise Gold, to establish the first deep listening retreat at the Rose Mountain Retreat Center, together with author and playwright, director and improviser, and her artistic and life partner, Ioni. These three women joined their experience with scores for interactive listening and sounding, movement scores and dream sharing, and I was fortunate to take part later in three international retreats.
A book we all continually draw upon is the well-known Deep Listening, a Composer's Sound Practice. In the introduction, Pauline writes, quote, Deep listening is a form of meditation. Attention is directed to the interplay of sounds and silences with a sound-silence continuum. Sound is not limited to musical or speaking sounds, but is inclusive of all perceptible vibrations, sonic formations. The relationship of all perceptible sounds is important. The practice is intended to expand consciousness to the whole space-time continuum of sound silences. Deep listening is a process that extends the listener to this continuum, as well as to focus instantaneously on a single sound, engagement to target a detail, or sequences of sound silence. The practice of deep listening is intended to facilitate creativity in art and life through this form of meditation. Creativity means the formation of new patterns, exceeding the limitations and boundaries of old patterns or using old patterns in new ways. Animals are deep listeners. When you enter an environment where there are birds, insects, or animals, they are listening to you completely. You are received. Your presence may be the difference between life and death for the creatures of the environment. Listening is survival. End quote. Listening question 17. How many sounds can you hear all at once? At the TED Talk in Indianapolis, quoted earlier, Pauline goes further. The level of awareness of soundscape brought about by deep listening can lead to the possibility of shaping the chaotic sounds of technology and of urban environments and machinery. Deep listening designers, engineers, and city planners could enhance the quality of life along with artists, sound artists, composers, musicians, and all people who care about sound. While R. Murray Schaefer was defining features of the soundscape, such as the keynote sounds, sound signal, and sound mark, and Bernie Krauss was considering the relationships between biophony, including the niche hypothesis, geophony, and anthropophony, and you can hear more on these topics in episode one of the podcast series, Sounding Places, Listening Places. Oliveros used the term sonosphere as, quote, the sonorous or sonic envelope of the earth that is comprised of two irrevocably interwoven layers, the biospheric layer and the technospheric layer, end quote. In a 2006 article, Improvisation, the Sonosphere. More on this in the second podcast of this mini-series. Listening question number one. What is your earliest memory of sound? How do you feel about it now? Oliveros was always interested in the human soundscape interaction, a subjective consciousness shaped by attention. While listening, becoming aware of four modes, sensation, feeling, thinking, and intuition, and always interactively improvising with one's sonosphere. Some examples can be found in text scores and sonic meditations, such as the river meditation from 1976 with vocalizations blending with key tones in the rushing water. 13 Changes, written for Malcolm Goldstein in 1986, that includes fantastical stimulants for the sonic imaginary, such as Songs of Ancient Mothers Among Awesome Rocks and A Single Egg Motionless in the Desert. In Consideration of the Earth from 1998, in which a solo brass or wind instrument player turns and plays to the five directions, including the center, interacting with sounds perceived or imagined. And to end this non-conclusive collection, there is Dissolving Your Earplugs from 2006, which offers encouragement to, quote, close your eyes for a while and just listen, end quote, and to listen to and play or sing along with a favorite machine or favorite natural soundscape. Listening question 22. How long can you listen? 
I'll conclude with a seminal work by Oliveros, included in her original Sonic Meditations, publication by Smith Publications in 1974. Number 8, Environmental Dialogue. Here I offer the 1996 revised version. I'd like to invite you to perform this work now or at a moment that's right for you. Set a timer, your inner clock, to 10 minutes and perform the following, pausing this podcast when instructed to and continuing again after your timer goes off. So first, please find a comfortable place to sit or to lie down. If sitting, I invite you to take on an active sitting posture with your feet flat on the floor, balancing first on your two sit bones, moving up the curve of your spine to feel your shoulders hanging relaxed above your ribs, and your head balancing nicely on the top for the bed prey. You might need to slightly tuck in your chin so that your upper body feels light and relaxed. Let's take a few deep breaths together, and if possible, you can soften your gaze and turn it to the ground or close your eyes. This piece uses the term, reinforce the pitch. For example, right now, I hear the hum of the ventilation. And I don't need to exactly copy the sound, but I can bring out one dominant or pitch that I most notice in the sound in a long toned out breath. For example, Environmental Dialogue, 1996 Revision by Pauline Oliveros. Each person finds a place to be, either near to or distant from the others, either indoors or out of doors. The meditation begins by each person observing his or her own breathing. As each person becomes aware of the field of sounds from the environment, each person individually and gradually begins to reinforce the pitch of any one of the sound sources that has attracted their attention. The sound source is reinforced vocally, mentally, or with an instrument. If one loses touch with the sound source, then wait quietly for another. Reinforce means to strengthen or to sustain by merging one's own pitch with the sound source. If the pitch of the sound source is out of vocal or instrumental range, then it is to be reinforced mentally. The result of this meditation will probably produce a resonance of the environment. Some of the sounds will be too short to reinforce. Some will disappear as soon as the reinforcement begins. It is fine to wait and listen. You may now pause your playing device. Welcome back after your adventure with environmental dialogue. So a deep listening workshop might include listening to the breath, listening with and through the body, listening meditations with global and focused listening, remembered and imagined sounds, and more. Sonic meditations and or text scores, listening and dreams, and solo or group creation with possible performance. The Center for Deep Listening at RPI offers a deep listening online training program for which I am a core teacher. Links can be found in the podcast notes. 
In the next podcast of this deep listening mini series, Deep Listening and Reciprocal Listening with Tina Pearson, I'll be sharing more of Oliveras' writings and her personal example of improvisation in the sonosphere, offering some of my own scores and asking Canadian composer Tina Pearson about her work toward a reciprocal listening created for World Listening Day 2020. And in the final podcast of this deep listening mini series, I'll be touching on deep listening as a source of inspiration for creating and performing with our special guest, Lisa E. Harris, who was interviewed in episode three of the podcast, Sounding Places, Listening Places. I could love my listening. I could listen to me listening. I could perform my listening. I could be my listening. Zero equals infinity. This was an inversion of some writings of Pauline Oliveros in The Roots of the Moment.